you got to, you got to go at this fast and you've got to maintain the momentum. Thank you very much, Tim, for that challenge. I'll do my best. Um, first of all, to thank the Ombudsman and his team for inviting me to this event. It's a great honor to be here, particularly as one of the people who was involved in setting up International Right to Know Day, um, which was first celebrated 10 years ago. Um, the, uh, it's, it's just to, for the audience here, um, to let you know that this is something which is happening all around the world on every continent. Um, I personally am going to be at a Right to Know Day event in Vienna tomorrow and in the Croatian Parliament on Monday. Um, and that just is a small taster of the, the many, many activities that are taking place to, to promote this very important and fundamental right of access to information, which is now recognized as a right. And we had recently this June another ruling from the European Court of Human Rights in a case against Serbia, which made very clear that citizens have a right of access to information in order to uh, exercise the right to freedom of expression, to participate in decision making, and to hold power to account. Um, next sort of introductory point is to pay tribute to Nikki Forest Amanduras for all that you've done in advancing this right here in Brussels, not only through your decisions in the, in the cases you receive, but also in promoting and educating people about why access to information, access to documents is important. Um, uh, we, it's, it's great to see that the incoming uh, ombudsman is not only the former Irish ombudsman, but also the former Irish information commissioner, um, who has personally assured me that she is also very committed to carrying forward the great work that you've done. And it's interesting to hear that you've been receiving fewer, uh, fewer complaints. Perhaps that is an indication of uh, if we're trying to take stock today and measure how, what kind of progress are we making on transparency, then we should recognize that progress has been made, and that's a reflection of that. I'd like to share with you a couple of statistics from the Ask the EU website, which we launched in this room two years ago. Um, and it's not all bad. It really isn't. Um, our data shows that around 75% of requests are getting either full or partial information, or they're being told that the information is not held, which is a perfectly legitimate uh, response in many cases. If a citizen says, um, and I'll come back to the European Central Bank, but we've got examples where citizens ask the European Central Bank, for example, for letters between the Irish government and the bank, um, based on information that, that had been reported in the Irish press, and then the citizens were told these, this correspondent does not exist. So assuming that that's a true answer, it's very useful information for holding the national um, uh, governments to account. So we're seeing a generally good picture. We're seeing about 17% of requests that have been refused. With, with this, uh, the, access, um, the Ask the EU website is a very dynamic site. Um, we have at any one point in time a large number of outstanding awaiting requests. Right now we've got about 17% of refusals, of which I believe 10% are awaiting responses to confirmatory applications. So um, that, that seems to me a reasonable number. And from all the monitorings that we do elsewhere in the world, I would say that the level of positive responses, the level of refuses, refusals in the EU is, is, a, is about par with a sort of European average. Whilst, however, a lot of information is being provided, what we can identify are a number of really crucial black spots. And that's what I'd just like to, to focus on um, in terms of where we as citizens, I don't like to think of us, Tim, as outsiders, actually. I think we're very much, we should be insiders. And if that's one of the issues which Europe is facing right now and really worrying about, uh, in the run-up to next year's elections is that divide. Um, perhaps we have been, many citizens have felt too much like outsiders, but we shouldn't be feeling like that. We're part of the process. And one of our challenges is getting the information which enables us to participate in that process. And that's what I'd like to look at with a couple of examples. The first example is related to a case which Access Info Europe has against the Council 
of the, uh, of the European Union. And I'm happy to be able to announce today, we've just learned it, that this, this, the decision in this case will be delivered in about three weeks' time, on the 17th of October. And what's at stake here is our ability as citizens to know the positions which different member states are taking in the Council. It's as simple and as big as that. We asked for some documents on a, a legislative process, actually, ironically, the reform of the transparency regulation. Um, we got the documents, but the names of the member states were blanked out, which meant that it's impossible for us to engage with national governments in order to discuss the positions that they're taking in the Council. It's a huge obstacle to participation. Um, we won the case in the first instance a couple of years ago at the General Court and we're waiting for this final decision. Encouragingly there is a, an opinion from the Advocate General which speaks in favour of the participation in decision making and counters one of the arguments that was put forward by the Council which was that too much participation, too much openness could interfere with the efficiency of the decision-making process. And the Advocate General notes that efficiency is not the goal of decision-making, or not the only goal of decision-making. And nobody ever said that a democracy is the most efficient way to take decisions. But perhaps uh, there are other goals that we should be taking in mind uh, in, in, rather than efficiency. So, so to have legitimate decision-making and that's important. Doru mentioned trust. I'm not so sure about trust, but legitimacy is definitely very important. There need to be open and participatory processes. And this is not just something that a few of the NGO activists are saying. We were very fortunate earlier this year to carry out an opinion poll. And the opi in the opinion poll across Europe, we were able to ask what citizens felt about transparency and how important it is. And for example, in terms of information in the negotiations taking place in the Council, 85% of members of the public said that it's either important or very important to have that information available. Interestingly, Paul, with, I mean, you know this because you were involved with Alter EU in, in the project that resulted in this opinion poll, we had 80% of the public saying that the, the, the lobby register should be mandatory. So there's clear support for what's being called for by civil society organizations. We need that transparency. An another issue I'd like to raise in terms of the challenges of transparency is to take into consideration the pressure that European Union institutions are often under when it comes to being more transparent. And to do that, I'll pick up on one of the examples that the Ombudsman gave of the European Medicines Agency. It is fantastic, everything that's been achieved. And this real paradigm shift in the European Medicines Agency, ready to be more transparent. But it's not quite as easy as that, because as I understand, some of the pharmaceutical companies are thinking of taking the European Medicines Agency to court to challenge their right to make public the information which the Ombudsman has required them to make public. That's a huge concern. Um, litigating against transparency, um, challenging um, the, the, the idea that the public should know um, what lies behind, the, the research, about the research which lies behind the medicines that we may be taking on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so there's pressure, I believe that there's pressure from the member states, frankly, when we're talking about the transparency of the council, and there's pressure from certain private interests when we're talking about um, transparency of the, of the EU bodies. Um, and the third point that I'd like to focus on in terms of a big concern is the kind of transparency that we need in order to understand some very crucial decisions which have been taken in real time. And I'd like to take the example of the European Central Bank. In the documentation that my, my colleagues Pam and Kim have been giving out to you this morning, or if you didn't get it yet, it's by the door, we've got a report that we've just put together on transparency of the European Central Bank. 
And what we're finding is, first of all, the level of responsiveness is lower. There are, there's around 50% rather than 75% of requests which result in what we could call positive answers. Um, in fact, very few of them resulted in actual information and a lot of information not held. But we also saw a higher than average level of refusals to provide information. And often it's information precisely about the relationships between member states and the ECB in discussions over the financial crisis. It was um, disappointing to see that Bloomberg News Agency lost a case last November. They'd been trying to find out what the European Central Bank knew about Greek debt in advance of everything going really bad in, and wrong in Greece. Um, and they were denied that information. Uh, there is an appeal to the, uh, the, the Court of Justice on, in, that's, that's underway, and we probably have to wait a little while till we hear the outcome of that case. One of the problems that we've identified is that the European Central Bank has put into its internal decision on access to documents uh, exceptions which are not exceptions which are included in Regulation 1049. In fact, we've been doing some research and we've discovered that about 30 different EU um, bodies have their own internal decisions on access to documents which in some way or other have some divergence, let's say, from Regulation 1049, which was adopted by the, the Council and the Parliament. So, for example, the European Central Bank has added in 2011, presumably, I, I, it looks like, in response to the financial crisis, added an exception on the stability of the financial system in the Union or a member state. So precisely the kind of information that we as members of the public might want to know What's the European Central Bank been doing about the stability of our financial systems becomes an area of information that is excluded from the reach of access. That seems to be a problem because in the treaties of the European Union, it makes very clear that the only exceptions which can be laid down are those which are adopted by the Parliament and the Council by means of regulation. And I question whether that is even a legitimate exception in that respect, if it hasn't been through that democratic legislative process. There's another exception which the European Central Bank has, which is perhaps even more remarkable, which is the confidentiality of the ECB's decision-making bodies. That's not protecting an interest, a legitimate interest. In fact, when you start thinking about the logic, if, it's, if, if, if something's confidential, you can't have access to it, well, obviously. Um, that's what a lack of transparency results in, confidentiality. So if, if it's prima facie confidential, then we can't have access to it. How do you argue against an exception which is confidentiality? Um, that's something that we will be taking up in terms of challenging, possibly raising with the Ombudsman or even through litigation. Um, but it's a significant problem given the importance of transparency in the area of um, re resolving and getting out of the financial crisis. So there are some challenges which we have before us. Just to finish, we do still have pending the reforms of, the, of Regulation 1049. I've never been that convinced of the, of the pressing need to, um, to reform it, except perhaps to iron out some of these problems that we've got, and also to sort out the relationship between uh, access to documents and privacy, which, is, which are both now rights. Um, we can talk about that a bit more if we have time. But what's very important is that if there is to be any reform to Regulation 1049, either before or after the elections, it should ensure that it is in line with the um, with the, the positive jurisprudence that we have from the court, the decisions from the Ombudsman, and that we should, all of us, and there are many people in this room who are working to promote transparency, we should ensure that there is no reform which rolls back on the transparency gains we've made in the last 10 years during the Ombudsman's time in office. Thank you very much.